Thank you, and that concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5351 <coughs> in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee on Deer Management in Scotland. Report to the Scottish Government from Scottish Natural Heritage 2016. Could I ask all members who wish to speak in today's debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Graham Day to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Thank you, President Officer. Let me begin by moving the motion in my name on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The report we're considering this afternoon is a result of extensive community, uh, committee scrutiny of the SNH report on deer management, which the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee of the last Parliament has, as part of its work on the Land Reform Act, asked the Government to have produced no later than the end of 2016. Let me thank everyone, stakeholders, clerks, Spice and the independent experts we heard from for assisting us in this process. Excuse me. It would be fair to say deer management is a subject which provokes strong views. It would be fair also, I think, to say so too did SNH's report. The task the committee had was to sift through the diverse range of opinions being offered on the content, mm -hmm. consider the evidence and come to a view as to whether the progress made thus far represented the step change required or, left to continue as is, would deliver such. Whilst recognising that considerable progress had been made in some areas of the country, our unanimous conclusion was that it did not and would not. For those members of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee who also served in the Raki Committee, there was, I think, a strong sense of déjà vu listening to the evidence coming from some deer management interest that it was too early to judge they'd not had enough time. You see, presiding officer, that was exactly what the Raki Committee, on which myself, Angus MacDonald and Claudia Bemis served, was told in relation to the Deer Code back in 2014. It had only been introduced in 2012. We needed to give it time to see the positive impact. Presiding officer, biodiversity targets have to be met and soon. We can no longer proceed with manana as a mantra. In the upland context, many deer management groups still do not have action plans that adequately address the public interest and will result in positive outcomes for the natural heritage. I'll come to the lowland context in due course. We therefore have made a series of recommendations to government, which as convener I will lay out. Presiding officer, the committee has come at this from two directions. Firstly, we've identified some specific measures we feel should be implemented by the government. Secondly, we have suggested the government might convene a short life working group, calling on a range of expertise, and whilst involving deer management interests, chaired independently of these and SNH to consider other aspects. Let me deal with those in order. The committee recommends that the powers under Section 80 of the Land Reform Scotland Act, introduced last year, are brought into immediate use and effect and deployed as required. Recognising that significant challenges remain around deer management in lowland Scotland, we are looking for this to be addressed as a matter of priority. We are calling for a strategic approach to managing deer numbers and impacts. SNH should be responsible for determining call levels in the public interest. Deer management groups should carry out deer counts using a clear and agreed methodology in their area on no more than a five-year cycle and return planned deer call details to SNH whilst the Scottish Government, through relevant agencies and local authorities, should undertake deer counts in areas not covered by a DMG. Sitting alongside this, the close season for stags should be reviewed with the aim of ensuring such restrictions as shooting promote rather than hinder effective deer management from both an ecological and a crop protection perspective. Access to such data will, over time, identify trends around densities and inform appropriate culling levels based upon impacts at a local level. This will allow for local flexibility rather than one size fits all. We believe there is a need for much greater clarity around public objectives and their relative importance set against private objectives at a local level and within each DMG area. Appropriate density should then be set and both the densities and impacts monitored going forward. The committee are further of the view that the current powers, namely sections 7 and 8, are inadequate. As the SNH report illustrates, section 7 agreements are failing to deliver. There were, at the time of the report, 11 such agreements in place. Deer density targets had been met in only six. Habitat targets had been met in just three, partially in two others. The failure of SNH to use Section 8 powers is seen by many as being down to a fear they would be open to challenge. The committee recommends that the government takes urgent action to devise alternative measures and simple provisions that lead to action to protect and restore habitats and sites impacted by deer. What's needed is an effective backstop power that is fit for purpose. With similar urgency, we recommend the Government Commission an, an analysis of incentives and their use in supporting deer management in the public interest. We are also unanimously of the view that an action plan must be prepared to deliver 
as the SGA has called for, a publicly funded network of deer larders across mainland and island Scotland to support greater opportunities for participation in deer culling. Signing officer, the committee has offered its thoughts too on the performance of Scottish natural heritage in relation to deer management. We are of the view that SNH has not provided the level of leadership that might have been expected and there has been a failure to adequately set expectations for deer management in Scotland. SNH appears to have been unable or unwilling to enforce the legislation to secure the natural heritage interests. Further, we felt that knowledge and data gaps ought to have been addressed at an earlier stage by the commissioning of work in time to consider and incorporate the findings into the report. That said, the committee is concerned that SNH may not have the capacity to fully deliver all its duties, including deer management, without additional resources. Now, let me turn to the Short Life Working Group proposal. One of the things which I think struck us in taking evidence was the range of expertise and thinking out there around deer management. We're looking for that to be tapped into in order to identify how best to deliver some of the actions we've called for. This is not about kicking these matters into the long grass, far from it. We need to bring people to the table with a clear remit and working to a tight time frame to provide the government with practical ways, practical advice on the way forward for deer management in Scotland, reporting back no later than early autumn 2017. Um, time constraints will prevent me from going into full detail of the suggested remit, but let me expand around two issues, presiding officer. Uh, one of the most uh, striking aspects of the evidence we received on lowland management was just how little had changed um, from the Raki Committee inquiry of 2013-14. By way of example, despite these issues having been flagged up in the last Parliament and SNH advising that a range of work was underway, just one additional lowland deer group had been established in the intervening period. It was acknowledged in the evidence gathering process that there was no collaborative approach in large areas of lowland Scotland, a lack of data, that local authority performance in this regard was patchy, and there was no model or mix of models of deer management to be rolled out. We also learned that the Lowland Deer Network organisation had not consulted its individual member groups before making its submission to the committee. Richard Playfair of the LDNS told us, I would like to think we promote their views, but we do not necessarily know what their views are at any given time. That admission does seem indicative of an organisation that's perhaps not functioning as effectively as it might. And we're calling on the government to do three things, albeit with input from the Short Life Working Group. One, look at piloting a variety of new approaches, taking account of best practice examples. Two, review the approach to involving local authorities in lowland deer management, exploring whether one which encourages rather than requires their involvement. And three, examine the role and operation of the Lowland Deer Network, consider whether it is sufficiently independent of agencies that fund its work, and determine what role it should play in promoting deer management going forward. With regard to fencing, presiding officer, the committee are concerned that the costs are considerable and will continue to rise as existing fencing deteriorates. It was unclear to us if these significant costs to the public purse are justified, set against the possible benefits of increased culling. Our opinion is that there may require to be a rebalancing, but we would seek SNH examining the evidence base around this to inform such a decision. Presiding officer, that is an overview of the report. I look forward to hearing from members of the committee and others uh, as they explore its contents further. Thank you. Thank you. I'd advise members, including all the front and front bench speakers, that we've got plenty of time in hand. Uh, so, members, feel free to take an extra minute if you wish. I call on Rosanna Cunningham to open it on behalf of the government. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I, I think. Um, can I just say, in my previous incarnation in this job between 2009 and 2011, I did spend a lot of time in discussions about deer management with colleagues, environmental NGOs, and land management organisations. Um, there are still a very few members uh, left who might remember uh, that ongoing debate. And for much of that time, I was preparing for and then taking through the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Bill, which of course became an act, a piece of legislation that set out, among other things, to address the shortcomings in the Deer Act. So it's with a slight sense of deja vu and with some disappointment that I return again to this issue, with many of the same claims and counterclaims still being made about how deer are managed in Scotland, the economic benefits they provide and their impacts on the natural environment. So the first point I'd like to make is that the situation is not exactly the same as it was in 2011. There has been considerable progress. 
However, the progress is patchy. Many of the DMGs have done well, but some have done very little, especially when assessed against public interest criteria. There are DMGs which are newly established, and perhaps it isn't realistic to expect to see much progress from them in a narrow time frame. But in other areas, there are no collaborative deer management arrangements in place at all. The SNH report notes that despite the progress that has been made, grazing by deer and other herbivores is a major cause of unfavorable condition status in protected areas, and that deer grazing is a major factor in limiting the recovery of native woodlands. And the crucial point is that if deer densities were lower across much of Scotland, the economic benefits could be retained, while at the same time bringing about a reduction in costs associated with deer vehicle collisions and in the impacts on forestry. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee has now produced this comprehensive and detailed look at the issues associated with deer management. I'm very grateful to the committee and their staff for the thorough job they've done in examining these issues. I'm grateful also to the stakeholders and other experts who've given written and oral evidence in support of the committee's work. I think it is very significant that the committee has come uh, to broadly the same conclusion in their report about the present position with deer management in Scotland as SNH did in their own report. Namely, that while progress has undoubtedly been made, much more remains to be done. Where the reports diverge is on precisely what does need to be done. To be fair to SNH, I should say that we did not ask them to come up with solutions in their report. The report was commissioned to answer a specific question that was agreed with the then Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee in 2013, namely whether or not by the end of 2016, the present voluntary system had delivered a step change in effective deer management. And I think that was the discussion that was being referred to by Graham Day in his opening comments. As such, the SNH report is a snapshot of deer management in mid-2016. It is a very comprehensive snapshot, however. It brings together much new information and new analysis, focusing in the main on the impacts of deer management on the public interest, but also bringing together information on the socio-economic impacts. It is fair to say that the conclusion from the SNH report is that the step change had not been delivered by the deer sector and that there was a lack of confidence on the part of SNH that the present track would deliver that change, particularly with regard to the achievement of the 2020 biodiversity targets. The committee report, as we know, goes further in calling for some changes, including new legislative backstop powers, new powers for SNH to set cull targets, consideration of a new statutory duty to manage deer and the establishment of an independent short-term working group to provide advice on these issues. I know there are also other views and proposals among stakeholders, for example, proposals to set a Scotland-wide deer density target offer a new management standard for deer. We are still very much in listening mode. I found the SNH report and the committee's work very helpful indeed in helping formulate my thinking. I'm confident that this debate will contribute to that also. While I am not giving a formal government response today, I can say that I am determined that we will take the steps that are necessary to meet the concerns that have been expressed. I do not want to think that in another five years, we will be having the same debate again. However, we will be seeking solutions that recognize the realities of the world in which we live. There are no large sums of public money to hand out and the impact of Brexit on our own legislative timetable is still being assessed. Balance will be the key. The balance to be struck between maintaining economic benefits and protecting and restoring the natural environment with a continuing desire to build and carry consensus support from all those with an interest in managing deer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer members to my register of interests. I am delighted to be opening this debate on behalf of my party today because I have a real interest in this subject, having myself been a main board member of SNH for six years, admittedly some years ago now. Deer management continues to be a contentious issue. It certainly was in my time 
and I'm sure it will remain so going forward. The most fundamental challenge facing us, though, is the lack of up-to-date population es estimates for all species of deer. Now, I welcome the fact that SNH is working with the James Hutton Institute to provide those numbers across the Red Deer's main open hill ground range. But the lack of systematic monitoring of deer in more lowland areas and woodland means we only have limited information on roe, sika and fallow deer. That said, we do have some estimates on these numbers, and we know that numbers of red deer increased markedly from about 1960, reaching a peak in 2000, and since then, numbers have roughly stabilised. So based on the estimates that we have, it seems that the deer density in 2016 was around 12.5 deer per square kilometre, which is more than enough to be contributing to damage to natural features. And compared to the estimated 8 deer per a square kilometre in 1960, there would appear to be a need to reduce numbers. However, out of the 14 deer management groups that were scrutinised, only five had called to a level needed to reduce the population. And grazing not just by deer, but also other herbivores, is a major cause of unfavourable conditions of natural features in protected areas. We also know that more than a third of native woodlands are in unsatisfactory condition due to, due to the impact of herbivores and that they are limiting woodland condition recovery and natural regeneration. In addition to the environmental benefit of good deer management, there are also clear economic benefits from it as well. With over 700 full-time jobs associated with deer management, we should acknowledge the importance of this work in contributing to the viability of our rural economy. Deer stalking also supports increasing levels of tourism and, of course, the sale of venison. And in this regard, I support and welcome the call for public funding for the establish establishment of a network of deer larders yeah. across Scotland. Now, my experience in this field comes from my work with SNH rather than in the countryside with deer management groups. But there are concerns that I have with DMGs. They are having mixed success on the ground, with less than 50% adequately identifying actions in their plans to manage the impact on designated features from herbivores. And I am glad to see that there have been improvements in quantifying and auditing resources through the planning process. But that said, I still have concerns over the success in linking planning with implementation through identifying the specific steps necessary to deal with management issues. But as Scottish Land and Estates have pointed, pointed out, it is right that we give DMGs the time to deliver further improvements. We must also recognise that two years is far too short a time to see real improvements in biodiversity on the ground. And I also note the specific criticism by the committee namely the lack of formal structure for lowland deer management and the lack of leadership from SNH in this, manner, in this matter. And although there is some management in the lowland areas and private land through deer stocking, I do recognise that this area will need to be looked at further to ensure that we are hitting the targets required. The lack of leadership from SNH has quite possibly contributed to the delay in deer management plans and that is due to SNH's failure to be clear on their expectations from the start. Presiding officer, there is undoubtedly more to be done, and some deer management groups need to be encouraged to do much more. But I do welcome the progress of DMG so far, and I hope that we in this chamber can continue to support their plans as we seek to protect natural features in protected areas. I would argue that we need to give this process more time to bed in and to start showing the results which we all want to see, namely deer numbers at sustainable levels with healthy animals on the ground and our natural, national heritage and biodiversity in better condition. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the committee welcomes the fact that progress has been made in deer management in Scotland in recent years, but this remains a complex issue with competing objectives within and across deer management groups and often not very much involvement with the local community in some of these. And in areas 
uh, in some areas which do not have established deer management groups at all, as we've heard from uh, the first two speakers. According to the Forest Policy Group briefing, the, our committee report is a timely alarm call. Their briefing also states that our recommendations show that the entire regulatory system needs to be recalibrated to meet the legitimate expectations of society in the 21st century. This is indeed the case. Scotland has battled a growing problem with wild deer for over 150 years and the issue has um, developed to damage some of our woodland and threaten biodiversity, public safety and the welfare of deer themselves in some instances. While it would serve us well to remember that deer are wild animals and belong to no one, the issue of shootable stags on properties which manage stalking has been one of the reasons why deer management has not been properly addressed in the public interest. Overfeeding can undermine woodland regeneration efforts and has a broad knock-on effect on important habitats and biodiversity. And as we heard from the committee convener, Graham Day, Scotland's handling of deer management will be pivotal for biodiversity improvements for the future and achieving the ACHI 2020 target will, will need redoubling of efforts. Evidence shows that deer in Scotland, as we heard in committee, can be three times smaller than deer in Norway due to the environmental conditions and competition for food. It is untenable to continue to allow this public resource to go undermanaged and in some places inappropriately managed. As a member of the previous RACI committee, I took through deer management amendments to the Land Reform Act along with Mike Russell. It is encouraging that deer management parts of the Land Reform Act are now in existence and my amendment ensured that the code of practice will be reviewed every three years. With such variability in performance amongst deer management groups, this regular monitoring is vital for identifying progress and challenges. But are these and other efforts enough? Our committee's suggestion regarding a statutory uh, duty of complying with the code of practice on deer management is clearly necessary. It was brought in as part of the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, but was always voluntary for everyone apart from public bodies. At present, SNH cannot set cull targets and they can only request returns. So what is needed is a clear expression of the public interest at a local scale using the tools such as the land use strategy and or regional land use partnerships and deer management groups who should be applying the herbivore impact assessments. Once we have seen this expressed spatially and publicly available, SNH should be setting cull targets to accord with the best land use outcomes for that specific area. In this context, I draw attention to our committee recommendation stated in paragraphs 319 and 323. And this is a difficult issue because as the cabinet secretary says, in straitened times, uh, it's hard to know how some of these issues will be funded and supported going forward. But this is a very important issue for the whole of Scotland. Turning to lowland deer management, our committee states there are significant challenges for deer management in lowland Scotland and indeed the committee is disappointed that there has been so little progress and in much of lowland Scotland there is no formal collaborative structures. This needs to be addressed as a matter of priority. Deer collisions with vehicles, intrusion of deer into suburban areas, fencing costs and culling costs are serious concerns without collaboration on a more formal basis than the present lowland deer network and real local government support for capacity and training for local authorities, these challenges will remain intractable. Changes must also support deer, uh, sustainable deer harvesting. And I've recently met with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association who are building, I quote, a constructive case for incentivising the public interest of deer management through the development of community larders and the utilisation of existing local skills bases. This would support local employment, the marketing of venison, whether it's from, uh, to, to help with food poverty or at the top end where we have a wonderful Thai venison recipe from the Tweed Valley um, uh, venison group. And finally, um, this will help with local employment. So Mike Daniels, to end, from the John Muir Trust states, these modest reforms proposed by the Environment Committee offer us a way out of the endless cycle of debate towards a brighter future for our land that will benefit local 
communities, nature and the entire nation. I call on the Scottish Government to set up a working group chaired independently as highlighted by our convener to help to take things forward but there are actions that should be happening now and I commend the report to the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you. We now move into the open part of the debate. Emma Harper to be followed by Finlay Carson. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin by reminding the Chamber that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow MSPs and the clerks on the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee and the witnesses and everyone else for their work on this report. It's clear from Scottish Natural Heritage report that progress has been made in relation to deer management in Scotland and in recent years, and that is welcome. As reflected in the committee's report, deer management remains a complex issue. Deer management groups across the country often have competing objectives and many areas do not have established groups. In November 2013, Rob Gibson, MSP, who was then the convener of the Rural Affairs Committee, stated that social, environmental and the economics of deer populations can be controversial and have even divided some communities. And this is still true today because there are significant differences in the management of deer in the uplands and the lowlands, and it is the lowlands that I am concerned about as there are particular issues. Lowland deer management is achieved in a number of different ways, ranging from informal arrangements with local deer management groups and landowners to more formal stocking leased from larger commercial forestry companies through to the more formal 11 lowland deer groups. These variations are a result of differences in the range of species, different behaviours of red and roe deer, and in the pattern of local land ownership. There are also practical challenges in managing deer in lowland settings where there are far more public interest and indeed more public access. Increasingly, there is an expectation that deer management should support public benefits. It is also clearly vital to Scotland's biodiversity strategy and the plans for climate change mitigation through woodland expansion and peatland restoration. In areas of the lowlands, there has been insufficient progress in ensuring that there are formal collaborative structures for deer management in place. In the south of Scotland, we have reasonable coverage with deer management groups in South Ayrshire and Wigtonshire, Central Galloway, East and Friesen Galloway, Estale Muir and the Borders. But there are still uncovered areas and as the committee notes, this results in the lack of information which is necessary to control the environmental impact of grazing deer. However, as the Association of Deer Management Groups pointed out in their briefing to members, it is not always correct to assume that where there is no deer group, then no deer, deer management has taken place. There are over 6,000 deer stocking certificate level one qualified deer managers in Scotland, and many of them will be active in the lowlands in promoting voluntary collaborative management and encouraging engagement from farming and local owning sectors and local authorities. As the Cabinet Secretary pointed out in her evidence to the committee, SNH is not solely responsible for delivering a step change in deer management, and both deer management groups and private deer managers must share that responsibility. I am of the opinion that SNH must therefore strive to work collaboratively with the groups. This will involve serious consideration of the evidence-based views expressed by deer managers these deer managers often have an excellent understanding of how best to achieve a balance between environment, employment and deer welfare. I was pleased to hear from SNH at committee confirmation that work is underway to highlight areas where they can develop better collaborative structures with the Lowland Deer Network. Currently, there is a pilot project underway which is looking at that range of approaches. There are recreational stalkers who want to go out and do more stalking but do not have their own land. And SNH is looking at matching such people with landowners who want deer to be managed. The Forestry Commission, which is a key player in the lowlands with large land holdings, is a partner in that piece of work, which is due for publication this year. I hope that SNH will work closely with the Lowland Deer Network, private deer managers and local groups to move towards a more structured approach in some lowland areas while being mindful that deer impacts are often more important than numbers and should be considered in a local context. 
Certainly, an organised, structured, professional approach to managing deer populations based on environmental impact and not necessarily their numbers needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Finlay Carson to be followed by Angus Macdonald. Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate on deer management and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's earlier commitment to make improvements because deer management in Scotland is currently not up to the mark. The report on deer management published by SNH in 2016 showed that the present voluntary approach is not sustaining or improving the natural heritage. While deer are important to Scotland's rural economy, they provide us with healthy food, recreational opportunities which bring tourism to the country, but are also integral to Scotland's ecosystem. But when deer numbers get too high, the ecological impact can be great. The impact of unmanaged deer populations can lead to suppression of tree and shrub regeneration, causing a loss of species diversity, which will ultimately cause damage to Scotland's natural heritage. The Native Woodland Survey of Scotland found that more than a third of all native woodland were in unsatisfactory conditions due to herbivore impact. Evidence suggests the view that deer are a major factor in limiting woodland uh, condition recovery. There are also socio-economic benefits to deer management, including supporting employment, contributing to rural tourism, providing sport sporting income, and of course, the sale of venison. One of the major areas of improvement must be in the way that we manage lowland deer in the future. I'm disappointed that there has been so little progress toward proper deer management in much of lowland Scotland. In many low, lowland areas, there are no formal collaborative structures for deer management, and this has got to be addressed as a matter of urgency. There are undoubtedly a number of challenges surrounding how we improve lowland deer management, and a number of these were highlighted in the Eclair report, including the complex land ownership picture, that a collaborative approach is not in place in large areas of the lowlands, that local authority performance is patchy, there is no model of deer management to roll out, and there's a lack of landowner investment. And while I do not doubt that these challenges are very real, I do not believe that there are barriers impossible to overcome. But there seems to have been little improvement since the Raki Committee in 2014 recommended that the Scottish Government seek to address the lack of success in lowland low low deer management. Since this report, only one additional deer management group has been established. So it's clear that we need to do more. The Clare Committee has recommended that the Scottish Government give further support to the piloting of new approaches, including a fresh look at the roles of local authorities in managing the deer population and the incentives and legislation around this, and to explore how the Lowland Deer Network is working and encourage much better working with Lowland Deer management groups. Deer panels are one way of providing considered advice, and I welcome the increased function around local community engagement that these panels can now take part in. The committee has suggested that the Scottish Government act to make regulations giving deer panels further functions relating to community engagement. And SNH uh, should give full consideration to the appointment of deer panels, particularly in Lowland Scotland. Steps like this could potentially overcome problems in various parts of Scotland where deer management groups do not exist. Progress has been extremely slow, but it's time now for the Scottish Government to take responsibility and implement a strategy of lowland deer management that will properly protect Scotland's ecosystem. I completely support the Clear Committee and their recommendations to the Scottish Government to establish an independent short-term working group as a matter of urgency to provide clear advice <coughs> on the way forward for deer management in Scotland. The Clear Committee has provided the Scottish Government with a thorough and comprehensive report and it's imperative that the Scottish Government now seek to address some of the issues highlighted in that report. Thank you. I call on Angus Macdonald to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Angus Macdonald. Thanks, President Officer. Is there time in hand? Plenty of time in hand, Mr. Okay, Macdonald. Thank you. Speak at length. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that uh, deer management in Scotland has turned into a, a long running saga, not quite uh, of Icelandic saga proportions, but long running <laughs> all the same. And of course, the arguments surrounding what constitutes effective and sustainable deer management are not new. Legislation to control deer and amendments to it have continued since the Deer Act in Scotland came into force in 1959. And of course, the issue has so many aspects to it that it's impossible to cover them all in this debate. 
Having served on the previous Iraqi committee in the previous session of Parliament, I became acutely aware early on of the need for Parliament and Government to grasp this issue and make some drastic improvements where uh, that were made, uh, improvements were needed uh, to deer management in Scotland. Uh, one of the frustrations felt by my former colleagues on the previous Iraqi committee and the current members of the Eclair committee was and is the failure of SNH to properly use Section 8s. Now, I have to admit I don't feel comfortable uh, criticising SNH, SNH because, as a rule, they do a good job in undoubtedly challenging financial times. However, sometimes they don't. But that can sometimes be because current legislation is lacking. And there's a strong argument to suggest that that was the reason for the reluctance of SNH to implement Section 8s. However, SNH also admitted to us that, uh, and I quote, we perhaps have not used those powers, that's Section 7s and Section 8s, or pushed the use of those powers as quickly as we might have done. However, our hand has sometimes been stayed by threats that our evidence base is not good enough and that therefore there would be a challenge, end quote. As a result, the committee has questioned the risk appetite of SNH in this respect. Indeed, when Ian Ross, chair of SNH, gave evidence to our committee, he admitted that there had been frustration at board level, as well as further down the line, that enforcement had not been utilised to its full extent. As a result, there's a strong argument. In fact, it's the committee's view that the legislation which aims to protect the natural environment from deer impacts is not fit for purpose. So it was clear to the committee that SNH has failed to provide leadership in managing the impact of deer albeit not entirely their fault. And the impact on the environment has been a running sore in the Scottish countryside for decades, if not centuries, causing environmental degradation and high costs to the public purse with scarce and soon to be scarcer SRDP, SRDP fund, funding used to erect miles and miles of deer fencing, money which could have been put to other uses. As an example, £23.3 million pounds of public sector funding was spent on deer fencing between 2003 and 2012 enough to cover the distance between Scotland and South Africa. And the SNH report suggests that given there's an issue of deteriorating fencing covering huge distances, if fences are replaced at the end of their oper operational life using public funding, this could require a further £100 million at 2016 prices. So as a committee, we were unclear if the significant cost to the public purse of fencing is justified, set against the benefits of increased culling level which is why we've recommended SNH examine the full costs and benefits of different approaches to deer management based on the available information. Now, there's no doubt, President Officer, that unsustainable deer numbers are impeding Scottish Government targets on biodiversity and climate change mitigation through woodland expansion and peatland restoration. So we need to see action, urgent action, from all parties, SNH, local deer management groups, and the Scottish Government, to name but three, as time is of the essence if we're to meet our international commitment to the 2020 IHE biodiversity targets, as well as our own Scottish bi biodiversity uh, strategy. Now, it's not just the e uh, Clare Committee that is frustrated that Section 8 remains unused where use of the power might be justified. Simon Pepper of the Forest Policy Group stated that the fundamental key to an effective system is whether there is credible backup power, and he claimed at committee that we don't have the a credible backup power in place. And it's fair to say other stakeholders held a similar view to varying degrees. So as a result uh, of the comments received regarding Section 8, the committee was firmly of the view that if new backstop powers are to be introduced, they must be supported by clear direction from the Scottish Government, and SNH must be empowered and resourced to deliver them. In closing, President Officer, I'd just like to touch on an issue which has been raised with me by landowners during my uh, travels in the Hebrides, and indeed it's been raised by lowland deer management groups in the past, and that's the need for more deer ladders, which uh, the convener uh, referred to, as well as the refurbishment of existing ones, which is why the committee has recommended that the Scottish Government prepare an action plan for wider supply chain developments for deer carcasses and deliver public funding for the establishment of a network of deer ladders across Scotland, including the islands, to support greater opportunities for taking part in appropriate killing activity. So as far as I'm concerned, President Officer, a good outcome of our committee's work would be a fit-for-purpose deer larder network across Scotland and, importantly, the introduction of legislation that allows SNH to ensure that a cull or culls that are in the public interest are delivered, ideally without legal challenge. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I welcome the committee debate here this afternoon on the perennial and often vexed question of deer management in Scotland? 
I can also thank all those who participated uh, in this inquiry, and particularly the, the very experienced contribution of members who served in the previous RACI committee as well. It took such a, uh, an important lead on this topic. Um, some progress has, of course, been made uh, over the years, but this latest SNH report reminds us that we've yet to see a step change in the management of deer populations so they can exist within the carrying capacity of ecosystems that they inhabit. And, you know, some of the debate around the SNH report between stakeholders was about the accuracy of precise deer counts between helicopters and on foot. But I felt that this largely missed the point because the step change that SNH calls for is in meeting the public interest objectives on the ground. And while there are, un there are undoubtedly excellent examples of deer management groups that are achieving these objectives in full and profitably, we need to drive progress across the board. The time for boulder action is now because so many of our important and threatened habitats are very slow to recover. Failures to take action now combined with climate change and a dwindling pot of post-Brexit funds for habitat restoration could tip them over the edge. Peatlands, montane scrub, broadleaf upland woodlands and Caledonian pine woods are captured by our HE biodiversity commitments. But grazing pressure, soil erosion, tree damage and habitat fragmentation are all strongly connected to deer population levels that are just simply too high. And this underlines the need not only to act positively on deer management, but also to bring into life the national ecological network that we recently voted on and agreed in this chamber. And it would be great if the Cabinet Secretary, in closing, could perhaps reflect on progress in establishing this network. The fact that less than a quarter of DMGs have properly identified what sustainable levels of grazing are for their areas demonstrates that the step change has not yet happened. And so is the fact that less than half of the DMGs identify practical actions to manage deer Im impacts on habitats that are meant to enjoy protection today. And it's quite clear that the powers and resources SNH currently have to intervene are not adequate, that a simple and effective compulsory backstop is needed to drive voluntary good practice alongside practical incentives. There is a case alongside this for implementing immediately the Section 80 powers under the Land Reform Act to establish DMGs where there are gaps and require more community involvement. But the compulsory backstop needs urgent examination and the starting point should be a short life working group. Now we agreed unanimously in the committee that a new framework is needed where SNH determined the coal level required to deliver the public interest, where DMGs monitor deer levels and submit plans to SNH for discussion and if required, revision. And in addition, this working group needs to consider other questions surrounding the cost of the public purse of fencing and the approach to deer management in the lowlands. We also considered it important for this group to be tasked with looking further afield at deer management in other countries. And there's much to learn, presiding officer, especially from our Nordic neighbors. I felt the evidence the committee took from Norway was compelling. Their approach focuses on the health of the animal first and foremost as an indicator of the health of the ecosystem that sustains it. And lower deer population densities in Norway have resulted in higher carcass weights, greater fecundity, and more impressive antlers compared to Scottish deer with similar genetics. It's not surprising given the long-term studies of deer populations from RUM have highlighted this for decades. But here we have a live system of management in Norway that appears to work well and has also controlled another major cost to the public purse, road accidents. Well, what do shooters and tourists expect to see in Scotland anyway? Herds of emaciated deer sweeping across the moor or the monarch of the glen resplendent with his 12-point antlers? There have to be economic advantages to putting deer and ecosystem health first. One of those advantages could also come from developing deer larders and supply chains for venison that many members have already discussed, especially in the lowlands. The lowlands is a gap which points the need for more extensive networks of gamekeepers and stalkers to gather the data and manage populations. More, not less jobs, helping to manage an ecological network across the country. So, presiding officer, I look forward to action from the Scottish Government and a return to this issue in committee, picking up the thread of scrutiny again when the working group reports. Thank you very much. Mr. Rusk, I'll call Mike Rumbles. We'll call by Linda Fabiani. Linda Fabiani will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Rum Rumbles, please. Yeah, the issue of deer management has been a controversial and complex one ever since I was first elected to this parliament when we started back in 1999. 
As a member of the Rural Affairs Committee then, in our very first parliamentary session, we looked at this. If I can say so, it's uh, interesting for me to see that on my return to Parliament for this fifth session, I found that the responsible committee for this issue is now the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, and not the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, and I can see the convener smiling uh, on that committee there. There has been a stabilisation in overall deer numbers in the past 10 years, and that is welcome. But a concentration of excessive deer numbers are still having a significant impact on the environment, and the committee has noted that there is an urgency to address the challenge. The report of Scottish National Heritage highlights the fact that it believes that half of all deer management groups have failed to identify the actions needed to control the activities of deer, and therefore the scale of the problem is huge. Okay, identifying the scale of the problem is a necessary first step before identifying the way forward in solving the problem. In addition, the committee have taken the view that despite the best attempts of SNH and the Association of Deer Management Groups, they can't be confident that they are capable of delivering the change that is required. The committee calls for a statutory duty of sustainable deer management. They believe that SNH should be responsible for determining the cull levels, that deer management groups should carry out effective deer counts and return information on their planned deer culls to SNH, with agencies of the Scottish Government being responsible for this in areas not covered by deer management groups. However, what I find surprising is that the committee at the same time as calling for more involvement from SNH is severely critical of that organisation for failing to provide the required leadership in deer management. So SNH appears to the committee to have been unable or unwilling to enforce the law as it stands to protect our natural environment. Indeed, the committee in his report states that, and I quote, it shares the frustration felt by many that Section 8 of the Land Reform Act remains unused where the power of that section might be justified, unquote. And we've heard members say the same thing in the debate this afternoon. The committee goes on to say that it is not convinced, not convinced, that the currently available suite of powers are adequate. Now, when a committee uses that phrase, we are not convinced, we all know that that is diplomatic speak for the current legislation isn't fit for purpose. The convener's nodding his head. However, I'm not convinced, personally, that new legislation is particularly the answer. Why? SNH recognise that there has not been a detailed assessment of the barriers to improve deer management and confirmed that they have not carried out a full analysis of how incentives, for instance, have been taken up and how, indeed, effective they could be. I would suggest that this really must be the starting point. I question why has no effective assessment been carried out to date? This is an issue that hasn't just happened recently. This is years in the making. Positive reinforcement of good practice is always, in any field, more effective than wielding the big stick. I would suggest, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the Scottish Government starts here. It starts by finding out what incentives are effective in improving deer management rather than simply going down the road or we must have more legislation. We surely want a situation where everyone... Yeah, of course. Claudia Beamish. I, I would just like to ask the member how much more time is needed for those groups that aren't getting their act together in the public interest uh, and aren't involving communities and indeed those places where this just isn't happening. How much more time is needed? We Mike Rumbles, back years. Sorry. Do we have to look forward years as well, Mr Rumbles? Yes. Mike Rumbles, please. I understand the frustration that that comes from, but that's no reason to jump to legislation. Uh, well, I'm just saying, I'm not saying that you, I'm Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm not saying that the member is jumping to legislation. I'm just concerned that the government jumps to legislation here. Um, I, I reiterate the point. Why have we not looked at what actually is effective uh, in incentivization? It's natural in any walk of life, as I've just said. You get far better, you're shaking your head, I, you get far better results out of people if you can incentivize people to do something correctly rather than try with a threat of punishment. And I think that may be the difference between the political perspectives that we have in this chamber. 
I feel that we surely want a situation where everyone gains. Land managers gain through incentives, the public gain, and our environment gains. And I would just like to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, at the very least, we should find out what positive incentives to improve deer management would be most effective. I am astonished that this has not already been done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rumbles. I call Linda Fabiani, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, a few of my colleagues have expressed surprise that, uh, as member for East Kilbride, I have asked to speak in the deer management debate. However, there's a particular aspect of deer management uh, that I feel has to be addressed, peri-urban deer. Um, the report and all, all the, the discussion we have um, talks about lowland deer, but I, I feel very strongly that peri-urban is much more specific and that this hasn't been well enough recognised either by Scottish Natural Heritage or indeed the Lowland Deer Network or indeed in, in popular opinion. And my colleague Gordon MacDonald just beside me here just told me a minute ago that when he moved to Cumbernauld his father was attacked by a stag. <laughs> so there you go. Who would have thought that? Um, and it's not that long ago. He's a lot older than he looks. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very real and challenging issue, uh, reducing the environmental impact of, of wild roe deer in the central belt, and it hasn't been adequately monitored or managed. Investment, attention and energy has always, I feel, focused on deer management in the highlands of Scotland for very valid reasons. So I do welcome this report by this Parliament's committee acknowledging some of the issues that need to be addressed. It recognises that wild roe deer numbers are rapidly increasing in the central belt and that is causing jeopardy to road users and environmental impacts on public and private grounds. And one of the things that uh, a local deer manager said to me that's always stuck in my mind is that of course this is happening because we're carrying out all these infrastructure projects, we build houses and actually the deer were there first. And there are particular difficulties in managing the deer on public ground. Um, because there's a really patchy response from local authorities. Like uh, so many other agencies, local authorities in the Central Belt don't recognise the particular issues. So it's very clear that what the committee says is quite right. A, a one-size-fits-all approach just does not work. So I was pleased that they recommended setting up a short-term working group. And I would strongly recommend, I can't recommend it strongly enough, that this working group includes expertise from local urban deer managers with the skills, experience and knowledge to help us move this agenda forward. SNH um, did give training um, to many recreational deer managers in the Central Belt. It's a very, very high standard. That's a significant resource in Central Scotland and we should use it to much better effect to manage deer. But instead, we often find that deer management is commissioned from private contractors rather than from those who've actually been keeping our roads, our streets, our towns safe for many, many years. I think um, I mentioned, I think, the South Lanarkshire Deer Group earlier, and, and this was a group that I've been working with for many, many years. And it's well noted for its standard of collaboration uh, between deer managers and other partners, and they've been recognised for their contributions to training and the deer code. In fact, uh, development of other deer groups have been modelled on it. I don't see why groups like this are not routinely included in deer management plans, because their local knowledge and expertise is therefore being ignored. And again, that's about that one-size-fits-all approach. We shouldn't be pursuing it. If I have time, I'm more than happy to. Yes, Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank the member for taking the intervention. It's obviously interesting that there are some areas in rural, uh, 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 sorry, in urban areas which deer come into conflict with the uh, population, not only on roads but also in their gardens. Does the member feel that fencing and excluding the deer in, from those problem areas would play an important part in making sure that we can still see wildlife in, uh, in urban areas? Linda Fabiani. I, I mean, what I would say to Edward Mountain, presiding officer, is that whilst that sounds like quite a good idea, I think the complexities of deer management in cities, in towns, in urban settings 
um, requires a lot more looking at than coming up with instant solutions. And that hits at the heart of the problem. We haven't really looked at the issues of urban deer management. We are still trying to apply solutions um, that are perhaps better for areas where deer herd, for example, rather than when you have individual family units of deer like you have with the roe deer in the central belt. Um, I, I think that the, the SNH report just didn't demonstrate that detailed knowledge and understanding of the, the very different challenges that there are for peri-urban urban deer management against rural deer management. You know, urban Scotland isn't swathed anymore in woodland. Um, what we have is we have farms, small holdings, private land, publicly owned, la owned land, housing estates, as mentioned. And it needs very, very different solutions and different relationships. So again, um, the short-term working group is welcome. But let's make sure that we cover all aspects of it. If I can, presiding officer, I'd like to move on to uh, another aspect quickly, if there's time. There's time in hand, um, yes. Oh, thank you very you much. You rarely speak, so I'll be generous. <laughs> right. So another aspect of deer management, which is covered by the committee report, and a few um, colleagues have mentioned it, it's the establishment of deer larders to help with the processing and marketing of venison products. You know, venison, deer meat, is one of the most nutritious forms of protein uh, that we produce in Scotland, and it's grown naturally, and it's abundant in the central belt, but it's not available to consumers in central Scotland. So one of the most valuable forms of protein on our doorstep you know, close by to big population centres. And we're the only people not be able to consume it in other than tiny quantities because most of this valuable resource is exported directly to Europe, which is great. But it should also circulate in the local economy. And the reason that it doesn't is about a lack of infrastructure. So, although we have many highly qualified deer ma uh, managers in the central belt, there's no infrastructure to deal with the deer after they've been culled. So, I would ask that we do look into setting up larger facilities where deer can become a local venison resource, benefiting the communities that quite often would benefit most. Good quality food with low carbon miles. A reduction in some of the, the very sickening behaviour we've seen against wildlife by poachers in our area, and it could also help employment. I'm pleased to see the South Lanarkshire Deer Group. I'm sorry, I have to say to the member, I've been very been generous, been enough, but I? no, I'm okay. not overly well, let, generous. Please <laughs> conclude. Let me just close, presiding officer, by saying we have a, a deer code for all in Scotland, but it seems there's no local authorities, councils, or indeed nature reserves in the central belt taking a bit of notice. I would like to see a pilot scheme set up looking specifically at central belt deer management and I would like the central belt deer managers to get the respect that they have deserved for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call David Stewart to close for Labour. Six minutes or thereabouts, Mr Stewart. Thank you for your generosity, President Officer. Um, could I, first of all, thank uh, particularly the members of the Clare Committee for their input into this report and in this debate, but as well as, of course, the other members uh, who are not members of the committee who have spoken today, which I felt has been an interesting and insightful uh, debate across the chamber. There's a number of key issues, how to manage deer, what the responsibility of the landowner is, uh, how, do you affect, how do you measure the effect of deer in the natural environment, what the role of the DMGs, the local authorities and SNH um, is, what is the role of the public interest clause? And I believe the report has been a thorough scrutiny of these issues. And could I acknowledge from the onset, President Officer, the, the work that the environmental NGOs have carried out uh, in giving evidence for this report, such as uh, LINK, uh, the Forest Policy Group, and the John Muir Trust, who have all incidentally welcomed the report, which I, I appreciate. Now, previous efforts to control deer management has been largely voluntary. And while there have been some inroads made, the improvements have plateaued and further action is certainly required. Now, not tackling the deer issue, clearly, as members have said, would have a negative impact on biodiversity, climate change, uh, peatland restoration and woodland expansion, as well as adding to the public costs uh, with uh, 
coping with fencing versus culling, um, and uh, of course, a mixture of both. Now, proper deer management should obviously have a firm impact on environmental issues, but will also help create jobs in fragile rural communities, such as in my region in the Highlands and Islands. This not only includes on-the-ground efforts with deer, but also, as many members have said, uh, with more ladder and abattoir services to deal with an increase in culling to allow the meat to be processed and distributed across Scotland to avoid a missed opportunity to help the food sector. Uh, as Claudia Beamish said in her earlier contribution, and I quote, sign officer, uh, evidence shows our, our deer can be three times smaller than deer in Norway due to environmental conditions and competition for food. It is untenable to continue to allow this public resource to go undermanaged and sometimes inappropriately managed. A number of members beside an officer has also referred to the Land Reform Act and through uh, Claudia Beamish's amendment in the last parliament, uh, the code of practice must be reviewed every three years uh, by SNH. Uh, the convener opened, of the committee opened the debate by saying that it was important to have an extensive scrutiny of SNH's report. There is, of course, strong uh, views about deer management, but as the convener said, there is also strong views about SNH as well. We have to recognise that. Uh, with deer management groups, it's been mixed. Some are still lacking action plans, while others clearly have done an excellent uh, piece of work. What the committee, which I'm a member of, want to see is a short life working group. I think it's a sensible solution to get some action for the next steps. One of the key issues Graham Day raised was what are the public objectives when it comes to deer management? He also pointed out what he felt was in inadequate legislation in the section sevens and section eights. And with section eight, for example, there's been no use of that section at all by SNH. I think uh, what I've picked up as I know, is some fear of legal uh, challenge, but my view as a member of this parliament for a number of years, if, if the legislation is not competent, the, the legislation uh, should be reintroduced to parliament. Is there a wider issue why SNH are not using uh, that particular section? And I would certainly welcome any view from the cabinet secretary on her wind up. What the committee have suggested is a backspot power, which I think is a very sensible way forward. There's also clearly issues around data gaps, and certainly more resources to SNH would probably help that. On a personal issue when it comes to the SNH report it's itself, what I felt, and a number of members agreed with me, was having a clearly uh, external, independent, expert peer appraisal would be very useful, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, view on that uh, issue as well. The Cabinet Secretary um, also raised the issue uh, about the whole, sorry, the, the, the convener also made the issue uh, about assessing the expense to the public purse. Clearly, when it comes to fencing, uh, it's extremely expensive. What we need to do is a cost-benefit analysis, looking at large-scale fencing versus small-scale fencing versus culling versus no action at all. Public spend a lot of money on this. We need to know that we're getting a good value for money. When it came to Cabinet Secretary, she talked about the deer management groups, and some uh, deer management groups are clearly doing a good job. Um, she also raised the issue of deer vehicle collisions, which a number of men uh, members have also mentioned as well. But she did make the point that the step change has not been delivered. And I thought that uh, <clears throat> The Cabinet Secretary made a very useful point, but she said, whilst the Scottish Government will take steps to address concerns, um, there is not going to be large sums of money to be handed out for this issue, uh, particularly when it comes to a post-Brexit Scotland. So, in, in summary, uh, Presiding Officer, I feel, and I'm sorry for the members that I've not been able to mention, I think this has been a, ex uh, an excellent uh, debate. Uh, as a member of the committee, obviously, I would support the recommendations of the committee, but I do think this is an important subject that goes before us. It's important for climate change, it's important for biodiversity, it's important for food miles, and we need to take action on this issue. And as Claudia Beamish said, we've been sitting on our hands for many years on this issue. Now it's time for action, and I would endorse uh, the report to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call up Edward Mountain to close the Conservatives. Six minutes or thereabouts, Mr Mountain. Okay. Thank you. Presiding officer, thank you very much. Uh, before I speak on this debate, I'd like to say that I've, how much I've enjoyed it. My interest in this subject is not because, because I own a deer forest, as some have suggested. Uh, I do own a farm with a few roe deer on it, but my enjoyment has come because I've had a huge part of my professional life managing deer. 
I've drawn up deer management plans. I drew up one for the Cairngorman Speyside Deer Management Group and for other deer management groups, and some of these plans are still running. And I've been making sure as well in my professional life before I became a politician that they were implemented on the ground. Not sometimes an easy task. This debate has proved to me that much can be learnt from taking evidence and listening to experts, but there is no real substitute for actual experience. And I, I think that came across on a lot of the uh, evidence sessions that were given to the committee which I listened to. When I read the report, I was pleased it identified some key and important facts. But before I look at those, I want to mention and remind members of a simple fact. Red deer are an iconic Scottish species and should be treated as such. However, it's become clear to me that some are fixated by deer management and micro deer management. We've had two committees in this parliament that have carried out reviews of deer management. There have been two assessments of deer management carried out by SNH one SNH report, two further consultancy reports, and it all seems a bit of an overkill to me. But it should be a warning to those people that are out there managing deer that they need to step up to the plate because this parliament is giving it scrutiny. Maybe scrutiny some that could argue that it is not truly deserved. Turning to the report, I'd like to mention four of the key points that have been highlighted by SNH. Deer numbers might have increased since 1960, but they peaked in 2000, 2001 and those increases have stopped. Cull numbers dropped in 2011 and 2012, and that was due to an actual physical event on the ground, which were two extremely hard winters where there was natural mortality, a huge amount of natural mortality. On one estate I know, they lost over 200 hinds in that winter alone. But the culls now return to the high levels of culls that were achieved in 2004, 2005. Road deer culling across Scotland have actually increased by about 30%. There's 38,600 animals culled each year. And also the fact that there is a huge economic impact of deer management. It employs 722 people, probably more, and benefits the rural economy by an excess of £15.8 million a year. Now, as somebody that managed deer, I want to mention five key facts that I think are fundamentally important and it's been picked up in the debate today. Deer management is not about numbers, it's impacts on environment that count. And it is also the result of grazing on those, on those environments by other herbivores such as sheep, rabbit and hares. And if we are truly to look at habitat management, which is what we should be basing deer management on, then we need to look at the management of all herbivores on hills. Now, I do accept that deer management groups have made progress on deer management plans. And whilst it is a collaborative approach that the committee welcomes, it does take time, a huge amount of time, to move things forward, as that Peter Chapman and Emma Harper suggested. I can tell you from personal experience that drawing up one deer management plan took about three years of my life. And it was about balancing the needs not only of the estates, but the Forestry Commission, SNH, and other interested local groups like the local community. Effective deer management has got to be responsible. And I've mentioned al already the hard winters of 2010 and 2011. We had huge mortality. Wet spring weather can bring the same effect. And we have got to make sure that whatever is put in place effectively takes account of events on the ground as they occur and we don't get tied into the numbers game. Now there were numerous generalizations within the report that I felt were perhaps misleading. For example there was a comment that deer condition is determined um, by nutrition i.e. the less deer you have the better they condition they can be in. Well that's fundamentally not true. There are other things that, uh, that uh, contribute to deer um, condition. Things like the parasitic burden, the overall health, and obviously a fundamental factor is genetics. Bigger deer don't just appear. You have to understand, and we all have to understand, that deer across Scotland will be genetically suited to the environment that they're in. Deer on Lewis are naturally smaller than you get deer on the mainland. Parkland deer are naturally bigger than deer that you get on the high hills of the Cairngorms. That is genetics, and that is where they've come from. Now, I was concerned that I heard that SNH was suggesting to set centralised targets. I've seen this before when we had the Deer Commission for Scotland. They set centralised targets. You used to go to the deer management group every year. The 
annual meeting and you'd be given targets. Those targets didn't necessarily achieve what they were supposed to do. Now, I also heard for an increase of seasons, and the stag season in particular. The reasons why I, I, I'm concerned about that is because it usually means that there aren't enough people on the ground to carry out the stag stalking season when it needs to be done. I accept fully that deer larders will be helpful, but so would markets for venison. We have very limited game dealers. Now, in summary, I could go on about one or two other things. I don't think I have the time, do I, presiding officer? There's a couple of points I'd like to mention, if you, I may. You've got another two or three minutes, at okay. least. Okay. I think that a working group would be extremely helpful, and I think engagement by them and the, and the deer management groups across Scotland would be useful. I believe the loss of the Deer Commission for Scotland that happened when it was insolved, uh, absorbed into SNH was a mistake. I believe that if we are going to take deer management seriously, then we ought to look at having the Deer Commission for Scotland re-established with the specialisms that it brought. So in summary, I think we should accept that deer are an important part of our heritage. Secondly, they're vital to the rural economy, providing income and employment. Thirdly, this debate and the debate about deer management should always be about habitat management, not about the number of deers, and we need to make sure that we manage all herbivores that infect upon that habitat. We should also encourage the formulation of deer management plans through the deer management group, and if necessary, we should get more deer management groups involved. Finally, I would say, presiding officer, responsive and local management is vital when you're dealing with living animals. Centralised and bureaucratic control based purely on numbers would be a mistake. On the basis of above, I think this Parliament would be advised to, to encourage deer management groups to work a lot harder on the collaborative management based on achieving good <coughs> habitats across Scotland rather than spending time on money trying to centralise and micromanage deer which won't be helpful to the deer or the habitats we're trying to protect. Thank you. Thank you. I call Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary, up to seven minutes or thereabouts, please, if needed. I will do my best, Presiding Officer, to use up the extra time that is available. Um, this has, uh, I, I, as I hoped and uh, mentioned in my opening speech, been a useful debate in helping us to crystallise our thinking on this important issue. So a lot of valuable points uh, have been made and in response there are some key points I would like to make. There's quite a new number of members who've actually referred to deer numbers and I just thought it might be worth putting on the record what the current estimates actually are. Um, we currently believe that there is a total of between 587,000 to 777,000 uh, deer in Scotland and the annual cull is sitting at around 100,000. That's about 13 to 17% of the total. And I think it's just worth us reminding ourselves what these actual numbers are when we're talking about uh, deer numbers. Um, the use of current powers was raised by a number of people, I think first by Claudia Beamish. Um, some of the discussion at the uh, uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee questioned whether the current legislative provisions for deer management are adequate and whether SNH has made best use of its powers to secure the natural heritage interests. I'd like to reassure the Parliament that SNH is determined to move forward decisively to ensure that control agreements established under Section 7 of the Deer Act achieve the desired benefits for the natural heritage. And since publishing uh, their report on deer management, SNH have undertaken a review of the eight existing Section 7 control agreements, and I've no doubt that where Section 8 orders are required, they will be brought forward. As part of last year's Land Reform Act, SNH were also given new powers to help address deer management. I should be clear that all of these new powers are commenced, and SNH uh, uh, will be looking to use these new powers from here on as part of their duties uh, for deer management. And I understand and share the frustration with the pace of change in this area. And the temptation is to think that new powers will automatically fix the situation. It may be that further refinement of or addition to the powers available to SNH is in fact required. And I have an open mind on that at this stage. However, I do feel that it would be sensible for SNH to try the intervention powers available to them through Section 8 before we conclude 
that they are not active, um, uh, they are not adequate. And I think that has been that has been the issue, the difference between the management of Section Seven and moving to Section Eight. Mark Ruskell. The Cabinet Secretary for giving way, uh, and, and, and I hear what you say, what, what Cabinet Secretary says about the application of Section Eight, but we've had these powers since 1959. Does that not tell us something about the inability of government to be able to act on this issue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I indicated just a few minutes ago, um, SNH are uh, quite uh, clear that they uh, are working very hard on the Section 7s, and as I indicated then, I have no doubt that where Section 8 orders are required, they will be brought forward. So there is a, 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 um, a current... Well, can I just press on just a little? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to completely lose the plot here in terms of uh, where I am. Um, I'm also, I have to say, cautious about proposals for new powers that might require significant extra SNH or other public sector resources to operate. And I have to be absolutely blunt about that. We do not have an unlimited amount of money to spend on this. So I, as I indicated in my opening speech, I'm looking for solutions that take that issue on board and that allow us to move this forward without a huge burden on the public purse, which in many cases would be getting spent on deer management that is itself a commercial enterprise. And that's an issue which we've kind of skated over a little in this debate until Edward Mountain got to his feet towards the end. And can I say in that regard that I'm grateful that Edward Mountain did do that because there is a tendency to forget that underlying this there are many commercial enterprises. But that in itself is an issue uh, about how much the public purse ought to be expected to step in when it is private enterprise that is at point. Uh, David Stewart. David Stewart. Oh, um, no, thank you, uh, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. I thought you were giving away to someone else. On the issue of the um, Section 8, is, is it the Cabinet Secretary view that the legislation is totally adequate and doesn't require any remedial effect? Or is it that SNH are having difficulty getting the evidence that there would be legally challenged if it went to court? Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to be diplomatic here. Um, I would like to see the uh, SNH pushing Section 8 before we make a decision about whether or not it is not um, uh, fit for purpose. Um, I, 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 if it hasn't been tested, then it is difficult for us to know that. Now, uh, I've used up quite a lot of the extra time already. If I can just very briefly refer to Lowland Deer, which was raised by a, a number of people. It's obviously something where many MSPs will have seen the evidence for themselves. I think Peter Chapman raised this issue, Emma Harper, and indeed uh, Le, uh, Linda Fabiani. Um, there, are, there are a great deal of risks in respect of lowland and indeed, as Linda Fabiani reminds us, peri-urban deer, not least of which the risk of vehicle collisions, which is now a very significant question uh, in, uh, in many uh, urban areas. I, I, even peri-urban might be pushing it now. I suspect we just have to outright accept that we are talking about deer in urban areas. Clearly, the deer need management, but it is the case that the problems are not the same as those in the uplands. And that means that the solutions and the structures are not the same. Now, the Lowland Deer Network has made a good start uh, bringing together those with an interest, mainly recreational deer stalkers, but there is no doubt that more needs to be done, and that includes involving local authorities in that, those who manage our highways and railways and other public and private landowners. SNH recently held a sharing good practice event targeted at public bodies and local authorities. It was well attended, uh, and I hope that it will begin to have an impact. Um, as I indicated, I know of Linda Fabiani's long-standing interest in this, uh, and uh, I know that she will continue uh, to push this. The latest evidence on trends and changes in the occurrence of deer vehicle collisions has just been published for those who are interested in it. Um, a number of people have talked about the uh, use of venison and deer larders, uh, members such as uh, Peter Chapman, Angus MacDonald, Mark Ruskell. Um, I couldn't agree more in respect of that. SNH have organised venison butchery masterclasses, although people might wonder what is the, you know, for SNH to have to be doing this. It's, a, it's an interesting question about whether that's really uh, what SNH should be about, but they have done it, and members might uh, be happy to know that I'll be opening a new deer larder in Caithness over the summer. So we are actually still... Uh, uh, opening new deer larders. I 
I've had a comprehensive and robust review uh, um, today of the evidence in the SNH report. I do welcome the scrutiny uh, and evidence taken from the committee. It's clear that there's been considerable progress, but more needs to be done, and we will look for a redoubling of efforts from the DS sector and specifically from SNH. So we'll shortly be setting out a clear plan of action to focus on the need to build on and maintain momentum and focus and ensure that land is managed to safeguard public interest. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I call Maurice Golden to close for the committee. Mr Golden, please, eight minutes or thereabout. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is an honour to be closing this debate on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The committee welcomes the fact that progress has been made in deer management in Scotland in recent years. But this remains a complex issue with competing objectives within and across deer management groups and in areas which do not have an established deer management group. We have heard much today about this and indeed there is strong degree of cross-party consensus with respect to the issues and the mechanisms that should be employed to improve the current situation. Graham Day ably outlined the key committee recommendations and I will echo many of his comments in my remarks. The Cabinet Secretary stated that progress has been made but there is still much to do. We can also welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is in listening mode. On behalf of the committee I would like to highlight key areas of the report as part of my closing remarks, namely the environmental impact, a strategic approach to managing deer, the variable performance of deer management planning, the capacity of Scottish natural heritage, the wider supply chain development, and finally concluding about steps moving forward. In terms of the environmental impact, although there has been a decline in overall deer numbers in the past 10 years, deer are still impacting significantly on the natural heritage and a greater focus and urgency is now needed to address the challenges of deer management across Scotland. The Scottish Natural Heritage Report to the Scottish Government highlights 50% of deer management groups have failed to identify actions in deer management plans to deal with the deer impacts in designated sites. Habitats take a long time to recover and the committee considers we do not have time to wait in delivering the Scottish biodiversity strategy. The scale of action needed to address deer impacts on the natural environment across Scotland is a significant factor. We need a deer management system developed collaboratively covering the whole of Scotland based on a clear expression and spatial articulation of the public <coughs> interest, particularly in relation to biodiversity and climate change. Deer management plans need to take an inclusive habitat approach, focusing on deer densities and impacts at a local level. We also need a strategic approach to managing deer numbers. SNH should be responsible for determining the cull levels in the public int interest. Deer management groups should carry out deer counts in their area and return planned deer culls to SNH. The Scottish... Uh, yes? Mike Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. Uh, from the report, I couldn't find out really. What, what does he think that um, the reasons are why 50% of the deer management groups are not performing this task properly? Maurice Golden. Uh, the committee took evidence with regard to that. Certainly in some cases, it was a case that uh, deer management groups have only been recently established and it's going to take time to deliver these deer management plans. In other cases, we took evidence that there wasn't the, the, the correct vigour employed in order to ensure that deer were controlled in a manner in which we would expect to be delivered for the public interest. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in terms of the variable performance of, of deer management uh, planning, which the member has highlighted, uh, there has been a notable increase in deer management planning uh, across the sector since 2013. But there's a considerable variability in this. Some deer management groups have worked to develop deer management plans with the support of the Association of Deer Management Groups and Scottish Natural Heritage. 
and in some DMGs there has been substantial and rapid change in their performance. However, progress on the ground in terms of positive outcomes cannot be evidence in all areas. In Lowland Scotland in particular, the committee is extremely concerned about the lack of progress and this needs to be addressed as a matter of priority. The committee is of the view that Scottish natural heritage has not provided the level of leadership in deer management that might have been expected and there has been a failure to adequately set expectations for deer management in Scotland. SNH appears to have been unable or unwilling to enforce the legislation to secure the natural heritage interests. The committee recommends the Scottish Government engage in early discussion with SNH in relation to priorities for delivery and review the adequacy of resourcing in light of the potential additional calls upon it and the extension of duties and report back to the committee on the outcome of those discussions. The committee recommends the Scottish Government prepare an action plan for wider supply chain development of deer carcasses and deliver public funding for the establishment of a network of deer larders across Scotland, including its islands, to support greater opportunities for taking part in appropriate culling activity. Now, following careful consideration of the SNH report, the committee can see no compelling reason why the interim measures that allow SNH to intervene, to amend and to lead on drafting deer management plans should not come into effect immediately. This should provide a backstop to ensure that all deer management plans adequately address the public interest. The committee therefore recommends that powers under section 80 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 come into immediate effect and are used as required. Looking forward, to address some of the issues highlighted, the committee recommends that the Scottish Government establish, as a matter of urgency, an independent short-term working group to provide clear advice on the way forward for deer management in Scotland and report back in early 2017. The group should have a very tight remit and should consider the recommendations contained within the committee's report. The group should also consider the cost to the public purse and whether there are alternatives to fencing that could deliver the objective, the approach to deer management in the lowlands, and also lessons from management approaches elsewhere in Europe. Presiding officer, the committee believes the Scottish Government should act on the recommendations in this report with the utmost urgency. Thank you very much, Mr Golden. That concludes the debate on Dear Management in Scotland report the Scottish Government from Scottish Natural Heritage 2016. It's now time to move on to the next item of business and I'll take a slight pause while I let members move to the front bench when necessary.